And welcome into In-Depth with Fox Carolina Sports. Hey there, I'm Aaron Cheslock. As we do each week, we catch up with local coaches and athletes and walk their path to the particular point in their career. We got one of the all-time legends in terms of college hoops joining us this week, Coach Dave Odom. Of course, we know him. If you're a Clemson fan, you know him as the Wake Forest head coach and the South Carolina head coach. And of course, Gamecock fans know Coach Odom quite well. Coach, uh, really appreciate you taking some time for us. This is a special treat for me as one of the guys that I used to watch when I was a kid watching college basketball. So I, I don't usually uh, get that opportunity often. Uh, but, you know, you got a really cool opportunity coming up in Asheville to kind of tip the season off. The Asheville Championship Men's Hoops Tournament gets going on Friday and Sunday, and it's a good field. Minnesota, Princeton, Western Carolina, or Western Kentucky, I should say, and the Gamecocks. Kind of bring us up to speed on how this all came together and how you got involved. Well, to really uh, be honest about it, Aaron, uh, you'd have to go back a year, a little bit more when uh, the COVID was uh, at its very peak. Um, we also run a tournament uh, called the Maui Gym Maui Invitational, which is uh, very, very popular no matter where you are uh, as a college basketball fan. So if you go back a, a year, uh, the COVID hit us pretty hard. We uh, tried to work it out to get over to – Maui, as we always do, and uh, we were not able to work it out from the standpoint of, uh, you know, fans in the, in the arena and travel and, and the things that, that go into putting a tournament that far away. Uh, from the East Coast, you're looking at 8,000, 9,000 miles, long way. And uh, when, it, when it became clear that we were going to have to find another destination for what we thought was only a year, um, we decided, we looked around and we had all sorts of suitors, if you will, people uh, that representing different sites that wanted to, uh, you know, us to bring our tournament, which is probably the most famous MTE uh, of all, uh, to their home. Places that that were all very nice, very enticing, but for some reason, uh, I, I, of course, living in the two Carolinas all my life. Uh, I knew about Asheville. I went up and I checked uh, the facilities at, brought in our Kipper Lesnick team uh, who owned the, the uh, tournament, and uh, everybody agreed it was a great site. We brought eight teams into um, Asheville, uh, the Herod uh, Convention Center, and played it right where the Southern Conference uh, plays their tournament. And, Aaron, I got to tell you, it could not have been better unless we were in Maui. That, that's the only way uh, the, the people in Nashville that, host, that hosted us were just absolutely terrific. Um, the arena itself and the people running the arena uh, were, were great. The media, uh, terrific. So it was a really, really good experience. And then a month or two later, we had some catch-up meetings. And um, one of our, uh, actually our upper echelon uh, uh employees, if you will, workers, a guy named Steve Skinner, who is the CEO, acting CEO of uh, Kemper Lesnick Sport, uh, just rhetorically said, you know, why don't we have another tournament? Uh, and uh, I said, well, that'd be great. Where you want to do it? He said, how about Asheville? And I was a little bit stunned, uh, only because most tournaments are held in bright lights and lots of people and water around, those kind of things. But when I got to thinking about it, uh, it, it made perfect sense to go back to Asheville in a startup fashion. And uh, so that's what we did. We started calling around, uh, first of all, to see if Asheville people wanted us back. They did. And then secondly, uh, to uh, make sure that we could get a good quality feel for the first uh, Asheville championship. And I think we did. I think you uh, related uh, that uh while ago when you were introducing the tournament. So, you know, in Western Kentucky, uh, you've got a, a coach there, and, and Rick Stansberry is just really nationally known, a new coach in, in uh, Ben Johnson at, at, um, at Minneapolis uh, in Minnesota. And then you've got Princeton, an Ivy League team. They're always entertaining to watch. And then, of course, the local team, what I would call the local team, is South Carolina. And we're pleased to have all four of them. They're all good coaches, and they'll have good following. 
Well, you know, I've always called Maui, or I've always called Asheville, rather, the, the Maui of the Carolinas, right? So it kind of fits right in there. But, I mean, Asheville does a fantastic job with the Southern Conference Tournament every single year. So I'm sure that played a huge role in it in terms of them kind of proving that they can handle that kind of atmosphere. And I think I think just a college basketball fan, uh, you know, I think the pre the beginning of the season tournaments are great because it's great entertainment for us fans. And it's really an early test for a lot of these teams that hope to be playing in the dance later on in the season. Uh, so I think it's a win win. Um, and obviously, you know, you mentioned South Carolina, the local team, obviously we'll get to your backstory in a minute, but as a former coach there and, you know, someone who knows the landscape well and really how South Carolina has a strong fan base in North Carolina as well. How important is it for, you know, the Gamecocks and Gamecock Athletics just in general to be able to showcase their basketball team in Western North Carolina where, you know, in terms of watching them either in the upstate or, you know, in the mountains in North Carolina, it's just you, you don't have that opportunity to too much. So uh, it's kind of a win-win in that regard as well, right? Oh, it's absolutely so. Um, you know, South Carolina as a university, South Carolina as a state, uh, has a plethora of really good basketball players each and every year. And following them are some very avid fans. And uh, one of the things that we want to try to do with this tournament is to give it a local uh, uh, kind of a local flavor if we possibly could. And, um, you know, the two major schools in this particular area are South Carolina and Clemson uh, out of the, the South Carolina area. So, we, we really want to try to keep that flavor in this tournament as much as possible. We tried it a year, not to our liking, uh, without fans. We, it, it wasn't something that we chose, but we made the best of it last year. I want to see fans in the stands in addition to some really good teams. And I think we got a chance to really have a good crowd. Um, uh, I know we've got four really good teams good head coaches, coaching staffs, good universities. All those things are in place. We just got to get the fans in there. And so far, uh, the calls are uh, coming in that uh, people around uh, the mountain area of Asheville uh, and down into South Carolina uh, all want to see early season basketball, good basketball. And uh, we're, we're pushing hard to get tickets sold and uh, to get uh, people in the arena to support the teams that are coming in. Yeah, it is a really cool opportunity. Again, it, the tournament gets going on Friday, championship game on Sunday. If you're looking uh, to go see some really good college basketball, you can get tickets right now at AshevilleChampionship.com. Again, we'll give you that information again at the end of the interview. But uh, AshevilleChampionship.com, uh, we certainly plan on being there and certainly encourage others to be there as well. Coach, we, we haven't really uh, seen you on the basketball court since 2008 in a coaching position when you retired. Uh, what's life been like after basketball? I, I imagine as you know, you've been involved with the sport for so long and we'll kind of walk your path here in a little bit, but, uh, you know, it's 13 years now. What, what have you been doing? And, you know, I guess you, you couldn't stay away from the hardwood for too long and getting back <laughs> in, uh, getting the tournament going here. Well, I had a interior, uh, laughter while you were talking about me retiring my wife says I haven't retired. I've just changed jobs uh, because I, I thoroughly enjoy what I'm doing now. Uh, the people at Kemper Lesnick have been so nice to me. Uh, they've given me a chance to uh, work pretty much on a 12 month basis uh, in terms of uh, the, the Maui Jim Maui tournament. And now we've expanded down into Asheville and hopefully this is going to be on a yearly basis. Uh, so I really haven't, retired. I've just changed jobs from uh, from the day-to-day -day pressure of college basketball, having to win and lose and uh, recruit and speak and all the things that go in uh, to being a head coach at the uh, very highest level. And uh, I, I, while I enjoyed that, uh, when I got uh, to be 65, Aaron, can you believe it? When I got to be 65, I said, that's enough. I've seen it all it's time for some of these younger guys to, to take it over. And um, I'm happy to say we've got some really, really good young coaches coming along. Some of them are going to be in our Asheville tournament this, this week. 
Um, and so uh, I, I'm really, really pleased uh, with the state of college basketball. It's different. It's time. I was talking to Roy Williams the other day, and Roy is going to be helping us with this, this tournament. Um, he's going to come to the games and the practices and, and, and things. I was talking to him, and he said, uh, you know, David, I've only been out of it now three or four months, but I can already tell the difference, and I can tell this is the time for me to get out of it, talking about himself. And he said, how have you done? And, and we just began to exchange some, some stories about, you know, setting the active day-to-day -day, uh, basketball uh, duties aside. And he said, I'm so glad that I've let that go. Things have changed. I mean, even the game has changed, Aaron. I mean, we've got uh, – you, you got coaches now are coaching the game. Um, it's five on five, but you got five guys playing around the three-point circle – uh, all five guys shoot threes. Uh, you don't have an inside presence. Um, that would that would bother me. It would bother Roy. We, you know, we always played with at least one and sometimes two postmen. So the game has changed. Everybody's shooting threes. If you can't shoot threes, you can't play. I do think that'll swing back uh, as we go along. I really do. Um, uh, it, it's changed off the court. The NCAA now allows allows it that NIL thing that I don't totally understand uh, to go into effect. And, you know, players are working for companies while they're playing and still getting an education. Things have changed. I hope they've changed for the better. I'm not willing to say that at this point. You know, it's interesting because you've experienced so much in the game of basketball uh, as a player, as a coach, and you mentioned all those changes. I do want to get your thoughts on that in a little bit. But, you know, your coaching tree is still so impressive and so many of them are still active right now. There is no handbook for what they've had to go through the last, um, I don't know, 18, 20 months at this point Correct. with COVID. Uh, and, and I know that, you know, we're looking at it specifically from the sports perspective here. I certainly don't want to minimize the impact that the pandemic had on all of us. Um, but from a coaching perspective, in terms of college kids, what would your advice be? Has anyone reached out to how, how do you keep your team chemistry alive when you can't have contact in practice? Heck, you can't even be in the same gym half the time. You're doing meetings virtually. Uh, there's just so much that they've had to navigate. Hopefully that this season is going to look a whole lot more normal. But did you have uh, any conversations with coaches that uh, – felt the need to reach out to you for advice and uh, is there anything you can compare it to in uh, your long time around the game? I don't know that I've ever, uh, when I was coaching, I don't know that I ever had to experience or adjust the way the coaches do today. Um, I've got a son uh, who's the head coach at, at um, Utah State and I talk to him on a weekly basis two or three times and you know he gives me stories that I'm saying, what? You're telling what, <laughs> you know, you, things that you just don't believe and things that he has to do that I never had to, to worry about. Um, and so uh, it, it's a bit of a shocker for me. I uh, when I first heard about uh, the, the change, uh, my thoughts went immediately to the locker room. And then to the court, the locker room being, uh, you know, that was one of the places that I tried to always stay in touch with each and every day. Uh, after practice, before practice, I would go in while some one of our players was maybe dressing, undressing. Maybe he was a player that needed a pat on the back. He needed some counsel. He needed me to tell him I loved him, that he was doing a good job, <clears throat> that his next shot will go. Uh, don't don't worry about it. And and uh, and then you'd, you'd move to the next player and the next one and the next one. And then Eventually, you've gone around the whole room and uh, you've, you've touched base with all the players that need it. And you find out so much about these players in the locker room. I always enjoyed the locker room because um, <clears throat> getting to know the, let's say, the, the equipment manager or, or uh, the trainer, uh, the SID people, they're all in there. and They're important. And now, um, you know, the, the reports I've got, the, that's not true. It, it's... Um, it's pretty much, uh, I would call it a business now. Uh, you got to have an appointment to talk to the coach. Coach got to have an appointment to talk to the player. I, uh, that was 
that didn't that didn't sit well with me uh, because I wanted my player. I want to be able to put my arms around the players and let them know from that standpoint that I love them. I don't know that that's readily possible uh, now as it was then. Uh, we'll see. Uh, the the uh, transfer portal uh, to me is uh, nothing short of an abomination. <laughs> I'll just say it. Um, I don't. It, it teaches disloyalty and not loyalty. Things don't go exactly. If, the, if a player misses a shot, he goes straight to the transfer portal. I mean that that that's just wrong. Uh, I, I wanted our players to all feel loyal to each other and loyal to the coaches, loyal to the university. Um, I live in Winston-Salem now, and I was talking to some fans that I know, um, and they were telling me, you know, one of the great things when I was coaching up here with the Tim Duncans and the Randolph Childers and Rodney Rogers and those kind of, is the fans got to know the players. Today, the players are in and out so quickly, they don't really – have a chance to know the fans and certainly the fans don't get a chance to know them. So it's going it, to, it, it may be okay, but it's going to take a lot of work on the part of everybody to get this done. Uh, because I just don't see it happening in a, in the spirit and the warmth that the universities and the people that support the universities and the people that work inside the universities are accustomed to. Well, you have been doing this a long time, so I can cross transfer portal off the uh, thing I need an opinion on. So I certainly appreciate the candor there. The show is called In Depth, so I want to walk your career a little bit because some of the younger viewers of this might not know uh, really all that you've accomplished to get to the Wake Forest and the South Carolina of the world. You're from Goldsboro, North Carolina. I'm not quite sure where that is. And you played four years at Guilford College. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Correct. Guilford College, a quarterback of a football team for three, named the most outstanding athlete in the school as a senior. Uh, you go right into coaching soon after, coaching at Goldsboro and Durham High Schools. When, when you're such a good athlete, when did it click that coaching would also be an avenue for you to pursue as well? Something you always known, uh, coaching in uh, your, your lineage there, or is it just something that you know the opportunity presented itself and you jumped at it? Well, uh, Aaron, let me educate you a little bit. Goldsboro is 52 miles due east of Raleigh. Okay. Towards the ocean, about halfway to Got the it. ocean. So I'm an Eastern North Carolinian born and bred. And I grew up uh, uh, an ACC fan. Back in those days, it was the Southern Conference. Um, and uh, I was a uh, North Carolina State fan. Um, in those days. And uh, I'll never forget. Uh, my mother was, she was right on top of me all the time. And about eight fifteen every night, I was, you know, about 12 years old at the time. She'd shoo me off to my bedroom and go to sleep. You got to go to school the next day. I'd go in and uh, I closed the door and I had a radio right beside my bed and I would turn that on ever so lightly. And I would hear, Ray Reeve, who uh, was the voice of the Wolfpack at that time, and he would come on and he would say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ray Reeve speaking to you from William Neal Reynolds Coliseum, where tonight the Wolfpack hosts the Demon Deacons of Wake Forest University, or whoever it was. That's the way I grew up, you know, as a kid, just listening to those kind of things. And um, I my dad was a car dealer. He was a Pontiac Cadillac dealer in Goldsboro. And I think he worked every day of his life to try to get to the point where he could turn that business over to me. And one day I was talking to my mother. I said, mom, I don't want to, I don't want to be uh, a car dealer. I don't want to own that business. He said, then man up and tell your dad that before it's too late. So I had a kind of a heart to heart talk with him. And uh, he said, I understand. He said, we'll, We'll do something else with the business, but you go do what you've got to do. And uh, I, I had been around athletics all my life. I played all three sports in season, football, basketball, baseball. Um, it, it's, it's funny with the World Series just getting over. Uh, my favorite sport was baseball, and 
I think I was probably better in baseball than I was the other two. Uh, so I, I really had a, a great feel for uh, the game itself. Um, I did go to Guilford, as you as you mentioned. I did play the sports there, and I had a um, – upon graduating, I had two great offers. One of them was to come back to Goldsboro High School and be an assistant coach in all three sports. But the best offer was my, my wife, my girlfriend at that time, said, I'm going with you. We're going to get married. We, I'm not going to – I'm not going to let you go down there by yourself. And I said, you got it. <laughs> and so here's the, here's the ring. We're going on 57 years, buddy. 57 years. I hope that for you. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so, uh, that's as impressive as any trophy you got in your trophy case. right? Well, there. I've been fooling her all these years, man. She thinks I'm something. She does. I know she is. So, uh, you know, I, I go to, uh, I, I go to Goldsboro, back to Goldsboro and, and, uh, do my deal there, and I had a great time. The people loved me. They still do, and uh, I love them. And then I went to Durham High, which was at that time probably the best school in the state. We had great success there. Lucky to get to Wake Forest as an assistant, and then kind of began my r- uh, run through the different uh, spots, but uh, I'll, I'll ended up back at Wake Forest after being at Virginia uh, with uh, Terry Hollins, the head coach, and Ralph Sampson. I talked to him on the phone yesterday, and so it was. It has been uh, a wonderful time for Lynn and I, my wife and I, and uh, just glad to be where we are and glad to be doing what we're still doing. Let, let me take the baton from Coach right there. So from high school, assistant at Wake in the mid to late 70s under Carl Tracy, ECU in 1979 to 1982. I believe that was your first head coaching job, correct? Yes. Okay. It was. Go. You go to Wake in – First in college. First in college, yes. I'm sorry. Yep. That's what I meant. Um, end up at Wake in 1989. You stay there through 2001. And pretty pretty incredible resume you put together there. First ACC championships in more than uh, 40 years, 91, 92 through 96, 97. You make the tournament every year. That's seven straight seasons. In a four-year span from 94 to 97, uh, Coach Odom's team's a 758 winning percentage. Wake Forest, one of the top 10 teams in the country in 95, 96, 97, 94, 95, 95, 96. Those are the ones that I can remember vividly. Uh, regular season ACC tourney champs in 94, 95, finished third in the AP, 26 and six overall, 95, 96. Conference tournament champs once again, again, 26 and six overall. ACC coach of the year in 91, 94, 95. And we cap off the wake part of the coaching career with your induction soon after retirement to the Sports Hall of Fame in 2009. A lot of the guys that we want to ask you about, of course, some of the stars in those uh, mid-90s runs there. Tim Duncan, arguably the greatest power forward of all time. You could call him a center, too, depending on what you like. Randolph Childress, an ACC legend. Rodney Rogers was so tough to deal with uh, in the post there, you know, and, and Rookie, uh, I believe it was ACC freshman of the year. Is that correct? He was. Um, yes, he yeah. was. So, I mean, when you have those three, uh, I guess a, a couple of questions. Let, let's start with uh, Tim Duncan. Um, when you see the skill set like that, that has to be developed somewhere. Obviously, you get a guy like that in, you know he's a superstar right off the bat. But how much did he grow in the long period that he was at Wake Forest? You know, you mentioned – earlier with uh, one of the things that annoys you about the transfer portal is that guys aren't staying very long. Well, Tim Duncan's one of the greatest players to ever play the game and he stayed. And I'm assuming you saw quite a leap in development from the time that he walked in to Winston-Salem from the time that you let him go to the NBA. Uh, If you could just speak a little bit to that. Aaron, uh, again, let's go back to the summation that you just gave. Um, when I first recruited, first saw Tim, I thought to myself, you know, here's a player that could develop over time. But he didn't have the skill set that he has now. As a matter of fact, it was exactly, it wasn't opposite, but it, they, were, they were tools. You know, he, he came out of, out of a small island in the Caribbean, 
uh, St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. And uh, he, there had never been anybody out of such a kind of a tranquil environment like him. And I took him, and, and I'm being totally honest with you now, I took him uh, because I thought we needed a player, a developmental-like player, not somebody who's going to come in and one and done us, but somebody that's going to come and, you know, work hard and be a good teammate and eventually get some playing time and then hopefully start at some point in his four years. I had no idea that Tim Duncan was going to be the Tim Duncan that everybody learned to love to see play and, and to get to know and, and uh, be around. I, I had no idea about that. Uh, I'd like to say I was that transformant. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, I just have to tell you. So as a matter of fact, I remember the first practice I had, one of my assistants, Jerry Wainwright, was working with me, and we were working on defending in the post. And I was showing Tim how to step across a, a screen, and I showed him, and back in those days, I was a lot younger, and I could do it quickly and not fall and all of that. And Tim tried it, and it was like a top. He started spinning and couldn't stop. And Jerry Wainwright looked at me like, don't get mad at him yet. <laughs> Let's give him a chance. <laughs> and I just laughed. I'm saying this is going to be a, a long process. Well, it wasn't. Uh, some changes in our roster occurred. He got a chance. Uh, he grabbed hold of it. Um, he quickly was known as the hardest worker on the team. Uh, he, he absorbed everything that you threw at him, uh, put it into his own game. And, um, uh, freshman of the year uh, in the league. And then uh, the next year uh, just took off. I mean, it really did. And, uh, you know, we ended up winning the ACC tournament. Uh, first time they'd won a tournament. And I don't know, you said 40 years, something like that. And uh, it was just a wonderful experience coaching him along with Randolph and along with Rodney. Right. People yeah. forget, let me say this, mm -hmm. you know, people forget Rodney because you know, he, he left after three years and uh, he needed to, his parents and all needed the money. So had no problem with that. But uh, Rodney Rogers, who came in in 1989-90, was probably the most important recruit we ever had at Wake Forest because he was a high school All-American. And we got him, we signed him, we had him in tow. And then Randolph told us about a month later, committed to us. And I asked Randolph, I said, Randolph, why wait for us? And he said, Coach, when you got Rodney, it convinced me you were serious about a championship. And I don't want to go anywhere where people are not serious about winning a championship. So when you go back to it, Rodney was probably the most important recruit we got. Tim was the most successful in, in – um, Randolph kind of bridged both of them. No, oh, that's that's pretty incredible. And again, those teams were as uh, dominant as any in the ACC during that stretch. You end up at South Carolina in 2001, 421 seasons and seven years total at uh, SC, 22 and 15 and 01, 02, 23 and 11 and 03, uh, 04. Uh, lost to Memphis in the NIT finals the one year, lost to them again in the first round of the NCAA. NCAA tournament the next year. I'm assuming Memphis isn't one of your favorite places to visit there. Uh, but then you <laughs> announce your retirement at the end of 08, and uh, you know Coach Horn comes in to replace you four years later. It'd be Frank Martin. What, what's your favorite memory during your time with the Gamecocks as we get set to wrap up here? Easy, the the the, the fans, the people. Um, we had great we had great players. Uh, we had a one year. Um, I don't know the year, 2006 maybe, uh, we, uh, we went to the finals of the SEC tournament in Nashville. Um, we played Florida. They went on and won the national championship. We had the ball uh, for the last second shot, didn't make it. If, if we'd have made that, we would have gone. They would not have. And I think we would have ended up uh, uh, 
winning the national championship that year didn't happen. So we went to the NIT and won that uh, for a second straight uh, year. Uh, we had a really, really good, good team. But the thing that I remember most is the fans followed us. The fans really supported us. Um, uh, I still have, I can't tell you how many close friends down in the state of South Carolina, all over, uh, up, up in uh, your upstate area and your area, down all the way to uh, the low country. And then certainly where Columbia is, the Midlands, uh, just uh, South Carolina basketball itself is big. And I, I, I certainly never, never forget uh, the people and how, how they treated my wife and I. It was a wonderful time. Well, I mean, it does kind of come full circle that you're bringing an opportunity for, you know, the state school from South Carolina to come play on a huge stage in North Carolina. Again, if you'd like to uh, check out this Asheville Championship men's tournament getting going on Friday and Sunday, you can get tickets right now at AshevilleChampionship.com. Coach, you have coached a uh, final question for me against some of the all-time greats, and you're certainly among them. Uh, when you look at all the great ACC coaches during your span, you had Gary Williams at Maryland, you had, you know, Coach Krzyzewski at Duke, uh, Dean Smith at North Carolina. Who, who's the guy that, that stands out as the one that you enjoyed battling with the most? Well, you know, it's interesting. You, you named those three. Um, Dean Smith, he, he taught – Whoever he was playing, me, you asked me. So every time I went into a game with him, I learned something new. He would do something different that the scouting report didn't show. And I, I remember so many times, and I had a great assistant, Ernie Nestor, sitting right beside me. And I remember one time in Memorial, uh, in uh, Joel Coliseum here in Winston Salem, and I don't know, we were one and they were two, or either we were two and they were one. Doesn't matter. But there was a certain play. It was uh, Duncan was on the team. Childress was on the team. They had uh, uh, some great players themselves, and and uh, they did something in the in the post that we weren't ready for. And my head snapped around to Ernie, and he looked at me, and we said, "That's it." <laughs> you know, that's the thing that he had never shown us, and we we learned. So he he was a great coach. Uh, the thing I learned uh, uh, about uh, Mike Shushevsky was that he was probably the best at um, handling people. Uh, he was very good as a basketball coach, but he handled his players uh, very well. He got along very, very well with them. And that showed me that, you know, that was very important uh, if you're going to be a successful coach. And when you mentioned Gary, uh, Gary Williams, he was the most fierce competitor that I ever coached against. But he also had the ability to turn it off after the game. But during the game, there was none more fierce than him. And, and one, one more that we should mention, and that would be Bobby Cremens. Bobby was a – he was one that you – and I, I'd put Jim Valvano in that same category. They, they, uh, you would never want to get in a close game with those guys because I thought they were, they were both – one of them was Irish, one was Italian, and they both had luck on their side. So I don't get in a close game with them. Go ahead, beat them head up, and then you can send them on back. And we did success. We were successful with that. But that's kind of the way. They had great, great coaches. And some, you know, Cliff Ellis was another one that doesn't get enough credit. He uh, coached at Clemson down again in, in your area. So a lot of great coaches, a lot of great times, a lot of great memories. Uh, I appreciate the time with you, Aaron. And um, I do, once again, want to, uh, give, send out a heartfelt invitation to all the basketball fans uh, in the state of uh, South Carolina and even North Carolina. You know, we've, we've got uh, a startup tournament we think is going to uh, do, do great things. Uh, these people can be part of it just as the teams are. And uh, the AshevilleChampionship.com, that's where you find out about tickets. Again, AshevilleChampionship.com, it gets going on Thursday or Friday and Sunday of this week. One of the best of all time, Coach Dave Odom. Thank you so much for the time, and thank you for joining us for this week's episode of In-Depth with Fox Carolina Sports. Catch you right back here next week. Have a great one.